Hey, Daily Bible Time, Dominic Steele. And over the next week or so in Daily Bible Time, I'm going to be working slowly through the last chapters of Job, stopping in to look at the chapters that we're going to zoom past in overview in our Sunday presentations in the next few weeks. Now, today it's Job 30. And after yesterday, we're in Job 29. Job spoke about the good old days when he walked as God's man, exercising God's rule, a life reminiscent of Adam's, and looking forward to Jesus's, then you get to chapter 30 and it all changes again. The chapter has two halves. In the first half, Job describes his experience of indignity. And then in the second half, after verse 16, Job speaks about, well, really his perceived hostility, the hostility he's receiving from God. Now, in speaking of indignity, Job says, but now they mock me. But now they mock me, men younger than I, whose fathers I would have refused to put with my sheepdogs. Job says, these guys are useless. They're unemployable, but they're mocking me. Verse 2, here's how they're unemployed. What use to me was the strength of their hands? Their vigor had left them, emaciated from poverty and hunger. They gnawed the dry land, the desolate wasteland by night. Now, when Job calls them senseless, he makes it clear he's not describing the virtuous poor. He's speaking about men who are poor because they deserve to be poor. They've got the character of fools. They're they're not victims of a cruel society, but they never worked at school. They never took the opportunities offered. They never showed honesty or reliability. They're thieves. They're violent. They're foolish. They're wicked. And these are the people who are laughing at Job. And that's what hurts so much. Verse 9, now I am mocked by their songs. I've become an object of scorn to them. They despise me. They keep their distance from me. They do not hesitate to spit in my face. Now, why does it happen that Job is mocked by these people? Well, Job holds God responsible. Job understands the disorder he's experiencing is God's doing. Now, this is verse 11. Because God has loosened my bowstring and oppressed me. They've cast off restraint in my presence. And at the back half of the chapter, Job laments that there's no answer about this from God. This is the line. Verse 19, he, that's God, throws me into the mud and I've become like dust and ashes. And then Job says, there's no justice in the suffering. Verse 21, speaking of God, you have turned against me with cruelty. You harass me with your strong hand. And Job concludes, given that he hasn't heard otherwise from God, that, yes, I know you will lead me to death, verse 23, the place appointed for all who live. Now, let me give you Christopher Ash's analysis. The last paragraph on his chapter, on Job chapter 30, it is just great. There is a divine necessity about the sufferings of Job. There's something so deeply necessary that it justifies injustice and the unanswered prayer of a righteous man. Centuries later, it will justify the most unjust action in human history when a man without sin is falsely accused, unfairly condemned and unjustly stripped of his dignity, excluded from society and submitted to the utterly disgraceful death of sinners. It will justify this righteous man's loud cries and tears going unanswered until his task is completed, Hebrews 5, 7. And if this was ultimately necessary for Jesus Christ, it remains necessary that Christian people should know what it is to have their prayers for rescue unanswered in the present. But now, as they suffer unjustly in this age, Ultimately, we shall see that there is a good purpose and a great purpose achieved by these sufferings. But not now. Not yet. Do stay with us for the next couple of days on Daily Bible Time.